All right, I'll try to keep tonight's message a little shorter than most so that we have time for questions at the end if you have any urgent ones and then you want to come back after supper tonight and do more questions. So um, I, I want to start by just mentioning Spurgeon's philosophy of ministry. When he dealt with the issue of ministry philosophy, he always began by pointing to 2 Timothy 4.2, preach the word in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. And that's not a complex philosophy of ministry, but it is biblical. And it's a pretty fair summary of the apostle Paul's ministry philosophy as well. Paul emphasized this frequently. He said, I've determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. He said, Christ sent me to preach the gospel, not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Uh, Paul said in Colossians 1.25 that the stewardship given to him by God was very simple, namely to make the word of God fully known. That is the task of the preacher. And uh, in fact, Paul told the Ephesian elders, I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. And that, in a nutshell, was the heart and soul of Spurgeon's ministry philosophy as well. You look at the uh, order of service at the Metropolitan Tabernacle during Spurgeon's era, and everything revolved around the preaching of the word. The reading of scripture was tied to the sermon, uh, the hymns, there were usually two or three hymns and all thematically tied to the content of the sermon as well. Everything focused on the sermon. That's what people came to hear. And that's what Spurgeon saw as the heart of corporate worship that uh, we, we do sing praise to the Lord, but the majority of the time in a church service was spent teaching people what the word of God says. And you can study all of the advice that Spurgeon ever recorded about being a pastor and pursuing a faithful ministry. And you can't help noticing that Spurgeon's ministry philosophy always began and ended with a mandate to preach the word of God faithfully. And I've been reading and cataloging Spurgeon pretty regularly since the early 1990s. So that's like 35 years now. Uh, but I hadn't really ever thought of trying to organize all of Spurgeon's ecclesiological convictions, his idea of the church and church life. Uh, I never thought of putting that all together into one preparation until one year when they asked me to do a breakout session at the Shepherds Conference on Spurgeon's doctrine of the church. And my initial thought was there will probably be an abundance of material for me to draw from because Spurgeon, after all, had a college for training pastors and his lectures in that context were transcribed and collected in several excellent volumes titled Lectures to My Students. And so I figured he'd have a lot to say about the church including his philosophy of ecclesiastical governance and church polity and guidelines for deacons and elders and biblical ecclesiology, his ideas about church membership, maybe church planting even, and the church's role in missions. I thought he would have a lot to say about all of those, but turns out Spurgeon's lectures from the pastor's college are dominated by advice about preaching and private devotions and the, the pastor's ordinary conversation and the call to pastoral ministry and the preacher's choice and handling of texts for sermons. He focused on the pastor and his role as a preacher. And, and all of those are great and very helpful topics, all of them tied in one way or another to the preaching ministry but there's very little insight into Spurgeon's convictions about church polity or the role of deacons and elders and the practice of church discipline and ministry philosophy at the Metropolitan Tabernacle and other ecclesiological matters. I think this would be a good subject for someone to do a doctoral dissertation on. But we can glean Spurgeon's ideas about those topics from things he says in his sermons, uh, 
But the places where he discusses what the church should be and how the church should function, those are pretty rare and not always obvious. In fact, if you want a, a, a document that explains what the church polity was like at the Met Tab in Spurgeon's time, Spurgeon's brother, James, wrote an article titled Discipline of the Church at the Metropolitan Tabernacle, and it was published in the February 1869 issue of The Sword and the Trowel. It's about the practice of discipline and church membership and matters like that. And in fact, I, I put a copy of the complete article online in a PDF that actually I formatted it to fit on an iPad. Um, and uh, if you're interested in getting that check with me, I'll give you the URL where you can download it. It's an interesting article. You'll also find a, a modern blog post analyzing James Spurgeon's Sword and Trowel article uh, at, my, at my old website, or at the, at the new version of my old website, Spurgeon.org. You just Google this title, Meaningful Membership at Spurgeon's Metropolitan Tabernacle. Meaningful Membership at Spurgeon's Metropolitan Tabernacle. Jeff Chang is the author, uh, but I think it's fair to say that Spurgeon's strongest views on the church and ministry philosophy, all of them related to issues that typically centered on the pastor and his duties and his character and his public testimony and above all, his preaching. And I, I think you'll see that as you delve into that topic. Spurgeon never referred to the Metropolitan Tabernacle as my church. He was careful not to do that. He had a very keen sense that the church belongs to Christ. And as a shepherd, he saw himself as merely a caretaker of something that didn't belong to him. It was a stewardship given to him. And in fact, in a conference for ministers, he said this, quote, it is a very delightful thing to feel that all the work we are doing is Jesus Christ's work. All the sheep we have to shepherd are his sheep. The souls we have to bring to him were, brought with, were bought with his blood. The spiritual house that is to be built is for his habitation. It is all his. Spurgeon said, I delight in working for my Lord and Master because I feel a blessed community of interest with him. This is not my Sunday school, it's the Lord's. And he says, feed my lambs. It's not my church, it's his. And he cries, feed my sheep. And then in a sermon at the tabernacle, he said this, quote, a true church is a very precious thing. It's not a mere human society banded together for certain objects, but it's a community which God himself has formed and over which he does watch with an unsleeping eye. It's a flock which he cares for so that heaven and earth shall be ransacked, but what he will have, uh, but what he will have provender for them. This flock is so well preserved that at the last great, at the last, the great shepherd will say, of them which thou gavest me, I have lost none. And he preached a sermon titled, What the Church Should Be. That was in 1878. That was 24 years after he came to London. It's, it's sermon number 1427, if you want to look it up. And it was a sermon on 1 Timothy 3.15, where Paul tells Timothy, These things I write unto you, that you may know how you ought to behave in the house of God which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. And Spurgeon began that sermon by making the point again that the church is the house of God. It doesn't belong to us. It's God's church. Spurgeon says, quote, the church is the house of God and in God's own house, a man ought to be on his best behavior for it is no light thing to draw near to the Lord. A poor man who is called to visit a prince or a king will anxiously inquire how he is to act. We, poor creatures that we are, when we are admitted into the church, which is the house of God, we should inquire what conduct will be decorous and desirable in those who are admitted into the presence of the great king. And so it's quite clear from things Spurgeon said throughout his ministry that he would not appreciate the sort of relaxed, informal atmosphere of 
most churches today. He, he opposed anything that smacked of entertainment in the gathered meetings of the church. We were, we were talking at supper about Spurgeon's view of church music and how he didn't allow musical instruments or soloists or choirs because he felt all of those things tended to become more of a performance than an act of worship. And uh, he opposed anything, as I said, that smacked of entertainment. He despised the notion that preachers needed to get their sermon topics from the headlines in the newspaper. He had nothing but scorn for pastors who thought that we need to study what's timely and popular, and that's what we need to preach on. And in fact, you'll see that very clearly if you read John MacArthur's book, Ashamed of the Gospel, uh, where he chronicles Spurgeon's ministry in the downgrade. Or you can sample what Spurgeon wrote during the downgrade controversy and, and see it for yourself. Spurgeon had some famous and fairly public conflicts with pastors who believed that they had to follow the fashions of the day in order to stay relevant. And I've mentioned this before, but the best known of those was Joseph Parker, who was pastor of the famous City Temple in London. That church, that church building still exists today. It's a little bit like the Metropolitan Tabernacle in that the building itself was was partially destroyed during World War II and rebuilt so that from the outside it looks the same, but on the inside it's, it's a, basically a new building. But it's still there, the city temple. It's uh, as the crow flies less than a mile and a half from the Metropolitan Tabernacle. And Joseph Parker was the second most famous preacher in London during Spurgeon's years there. And so what I want to do for most of this hour is I want to tell you the story of a conflict between Spurgeon and Parker. And I want to do that as a way of illustrating the conflicting philosophies of ministry that these two men had. There were many remarkable similarities between the two of them, but the differences, the things that actually in the end set them against one another, they're some of the most important features of Spurgeon's philosophy of ministry. And because Spurgeon himself was so focused on the preaching ministry, that's where much of my comparison is going to focus as well. Now, as I said, Joseph Parker was the second most famous pastor in London uh, during the final three decades of Spurgeon's life. And there was a notion in those days among tourists, especially from the outlying provinces of the United Kingdom and also among visitors who came from America as well. The idea was that if you came to London and you were there for two Sundays, you needed to go to the Met Tab first and hear Spurgeon. And then you needed to visit the city temple and listen to Joseph Parker the following week. In fact, uh, I think I've mentioned before that my pastor before I came to Grace Church was Warren Wiersbe. And uh, Wiersbe said this, quote, if I were in London on the Lord's Day and had already heard Spurgeon preach, I would hasten to the city temple and sit at the feet of Joseph Parker, whose congregations were second in size only to those of Spurgeon. And lots of tourists did exactly that. And city temple kept a section of reserved seats for American visitors, just visitors who came from America who wanted to hear Joseph Parker. So if you were an American, you could get in even if other people were being turned away. That doesn't seem fair, does it? Americans, they think they're all that, you know? <laughs> and I admit, I don't have a very high opinion of Joseph Parker. I wouldn't have gone to hear him. And, uh, and I'm going to explain why my opinion of him is not favorable. But he did occasionally dispense nuggets of wisdom and biblical insight. And also, if you want pointers on your style of delivery or the craft of public speaking, Parker could teach you. Like Spurgeon, Joseph Parker had an uncanny gift for communication. And by all reports, he was a captivating speaker. In fact, once a frustrated young man who wanted to be a pastor came to Parker's office and complained because the young man said he had tried everything, but he couldn't seem to get a church to hire him to be their pastor. And as Parker's assistant tells the story, this young man was scholarly and studious, and I'm, I'm quoting from a book written by 
Parker's assistant. He was scholarly, studious, well-informed, willing to work, but no church would invite him. So Dr. Parker told him to stand up in the corner of his study and preach his best sermon, promising at the end that Parker would give him a fair verdict, as fair as he could. So this guy preached his best sermon, and at the end of the performance, Dr. Parker, Dr. Parker said, here's why you can't get a church. For the past half hour, you've not been trying to get something into my mind. You've been trying to get something off of your mind. You're like a man who's anxious to get rid of a sack of coal. Parker was ingenious in devising practical solutions to common, everyday, annoying pastoral problems. He had an electronic switch under his desk that rang a bell in his secretary's office, and he used it to signal the secretary that Parker wanted to cut a meeting short. And so a story in his biography says this, quote, on one occasion, a very pale-faced young man went into the vestry, that's the pastor's study, and after a moment's hesitation, he told him, I'm studying to be a poet. No sooner did I hear those ominous words, says Dr. Parker, than I touched my electric bell with my left foot, in response to which an assistant appeared and we gracefully got the young budding poet out into the open air with the least possible delay. By the way, Spurgeon had a, a similar contempt for people who wanted him to listen to their homemade poetry. Um, so they were alike in that. One more story about Parker. When he came to London, he was besieged with invitations to speak at this or that event and people always wanted to know what did he charge to speak at events? And so he published this notice in his church's weekly newsletter, quote, he says, as an arrangement for self-protection, I am driven to announce the following as my charges for general public service. Preaching on behalf of the salaries of poor ministers, the charge is nothing. Preaching for ministers whose salaries are less than 100 pounds a year, the charge is nothing. Preaching at the opening of chapels, the charge is six volumes of standard literature. Attending tea meetings, the charge is 50 pounds. That's the 1860 equivalent of about $7,700. I don't know how to translate that into Finnish currency, but it's a lot of money. He said, going to bazaars, a thousand guineas. Today's equivalent would be more than half a million dollars. So he's saying he didn't want to go to, he didn't want to go and speak at bazaars or tea meetings. Serving on committees, 2,000 pounds, which is well over a million dollars. Anyway, the church where Parker preached, City Temple, was a large nonconformist congregation whose history also dates back to the time of the Puritans. So this is another very old church in London. No one knows precisely when this, this church was founded, but it was sometime in the 1500s, so very early in the Protestant Reformation. This would make it perhaps the oldest still functioning Protestant non-conformist non -congreg non congregation in England. It's a congregational church, not a Baptist church like Spurgeon's. And in fact, Thomas Goodwin, an eminent Puritan preacher and author, pastored this congregation in the 1600s. And when Joseph Parker came there in 1869, they were still meeting in a 200-year-old building that was located in a street called Poultry Street in uh, London's Cheapside district. And so the church was known as the Poultry Church. And Parker led the congregation to build City Temple nearby and they moved there and ever the, ever since it has been known as City Temple Church. The place I typically stay these days when I go to London is two blocks from here. So, so I'm familiar with the place. It's still in the same location today as it was when Parker preached there. It's the same building, at least the same external look to the building. And it's right in the heart of central London. City Temple's interior was destroyed in the German Blitz by uh, an incendiary bomb, which is a tiny little bomb that was dropped out of airplanes and it would burn its way through the roof and start a fire. It wasn't an explosion, it was a, a fire. And this device uh, 
burned through the roof and destroyed the interior of the building, which is the exact same thing that happened to the Metropolitan Tabernacle. So both of those buildings were rebuilt with their original facades. And you can visit City Temple today on Holborn Street in London. And from the outside, at least, the building looks exactly the same as it did in Joseph Parker's time. Parker had received an honorary doctorate of divinity from the University of Chicago. I think they gave him that degree based on one of his books because he never traveled to America at all, much less Chicago. But Parker was eloquent and his reputation really stretched around the world. He was a gifted writer. He was quite comfortable among England's upper class and he cultivated that sort of upper class air. In short, he was a man of refinement who was held in esteem by London's high society. And he's best remembered today as the author of the People's Bible, which is a set of 27 devotional commentaries that cover the entire Bible. To his credit, when he preached, he preached from scripture and his sermons were, were recorded by hand, again, the same as Spurgeon's, taken down and put in this series of volumes, 27 volumes, called The People's Bible, where he covers the text of all of Scripture pretty well. I mean, he covers it pretty thoroughly. I, I wouldn't say I agree with all of his comments, but he covered it thoroughly. And the content was drawn from more than a thousand of Parker's sermons. And I have a copy of it. It does have some helpful insights. I'll occasionally look up and see what Parker said about a text. Uh, and it, there's some useful sermonic material in it as well, but its style is very wordy and the prose is dated. It's hard to read because it's Victorian language more so than Spurgeon's. Parker had a reputation for being stylish and sophisticated. And you know that by, by contrast, People often commented on how Spurgeon spoke the language of every man. We've already covered that, that 1870 article in the Vanity Fair magazine that I put a picture of uh, the other day. Even, you remember, it spoke of Spurgeon's use of the vernacular as slang, which was a total mischaracterization. It wasn't slang, but he spoke in everyday language, the language of the working men. But Spurgeon was unpretentious and rustic and easy to follow, whereas Parker strove to be eloquent and urbane. And as a result, you read Parker today and his, his wording sounds flowery, unnecessarily so. And he doesn't communicate as well as Spurgeon to people in our generation. I have mentioned this before, but it's worth stressing that this is the reason why we still read Spurgeon and his sermons are almost as timeless as the day they were delivered, you would not say that about Parker. In fact, here's a sample of what I mean about Parker's flowery language. I literally picked a paragraph at random from the People's Bible, and this is what popped up. This is from the opening prayer of Joseph Parker's sermon on Acts 20 and Paul's message to the Ephesian elders. He, he prays thusly, quote, we will make our hearts familiar with thy love before speaking of our sin, for then our hearts will utter themselves in hope, and our spirits shall be saved from the darkness of despair. We will think of the mountain clothed with light, of the throne of the heavenly grace, radiant with welcomes to sinful penitence. We will think of the cross, the light, the blood, the triumph. We will remember that there is a fountain opened in the house of David for sin and uncleanness, and then when we come to tell thee of our guilt, we shall feel inspired and quieted by all the reality of thy grace. Now, there's nothing heretical there, but you can't imagine Spurgeon working so hard to sound elaborate. It, it comes across, to me at least, as bombastic. And I think it actually softens the truth that he's trying to communicate. And I suspect that perhaps part of Parker's intent was just that, to dampen the hard truths a little bit. And in fact, that's one of the major differences between the, the, these two men and their preaching styles. Spurgeon's sermons have a kind of gravitas that is lacking in Parker. Parker once said that the 
highest compliment he ever received was from an omnibus driver. An omnibus, you know, that was a horse-drawn equivalent of, a, of London's city buses today. And as this guy pulled up to stop adjacent to the city temple, he told uh, a disembarking passenger that he liked Parker. This bus driver said, I went there once and I enjoyed myself so much that I'm going there again the first night off I have. We laughed and we cried and we had a rare time. You see, he doesn't make religion seem so serious. Spurgeon would have been embarrassed to have a comment like that made about him. But Parker boasted about it, took it as a high compliment. Joseph Parker was actually two years older than Spurgeon. Uh, as I've stressed, Spurgeon was called the pastor at the New Park Street Church before he even turned 20 years old. He was an amazing prodigy. And so although he was two years younger than Joseph Parker, he was by far more seasoned and more experienced in pastoral work. And when Joseph Parker started his ministry in London in 1869, Spurgeon had already been in the pulpit of his church for 15 years. Spurgeon's congregation had also settled into the Metropolitan Tabernacle more than eight years before Parker built the City Temple Church. So Spurgeon and Parker were friends at first, probably never close friends, but they, they were friendly to one another and they exchanged pulpits on at least one occasion. And they were an unlikely pair. Parker was a suave looking, swank sounding lover of elegance and class. You see pictures of him, he was a very good looking man. Spurgeon was the son and the grandson of simple country parsons who had no desire to seem elegant or intellectual or fashionable or pretend that they were somehow more sophisticated than they really were. Spurgeon himself had very little respect for people who thought it was important to try to impress the world with how cerebral or, or sophisticated they were. Parker liked to go to the theater and hang out with the top hats in central London. And that was a matter of concern to Spurgeon. And finally, in 1887, this was after they had known each other for 18 years, Spurgeon and Parker had a major conflict that ultimately left Parker so angry with Spurgeon that he never really got over it. Parker was planning a major conference and he invited Spurgeon to participate in his conference and to preach the opening sermon. In Parker's words, this was to be a public conference between ministers of all denominations gathered from all parts of the country. And from the tone of his invitation to Spurgeon, it's clear that Parker thought he was being really magnanimous and offering Spurgeon an opportunity he couldn't possibly refuse. But Spurgeon knew, even though Parker didn't mention it in the invitation, Spurgeon knew that Parker had invited Henry Ward Beecher to come from America and to be one of the speakers in the conference. Now, if you know anything at all about Henry Ward Beecher, who was the most famous preacher in America at the time, if you know anything about him, you understand how odious his presence in London must have been to Spurgeon. Beecher was America's most famous uh, preacher. In fact, there's a recent biography of Henry Ward Beecher that's titled The Most Famous Man in America. And he literally was in the years after America's Civil War. Beecher was in the headlines every day, but for all the wrong reasons. He was America's most notorious adulterer. He had committed adultery with the wife of one of his best friends and his own assistant. And in those days, adultery was as illegal as sodomy, and Beecher was put on trial in a public court in a case that became the, the 19th century equivalent of the, you know, it was the trial of the century. In America, we had the trial of O.J. Simpson. Was that covered over here? So like it made worldwide news and Beecher's trial was like that. People all over the world followed the details of, of Beecher's trial every day in their newspapers. And his trial began in January of 1875 and lasted more than six months till June of, 1870, till June of 1875 when the trial ended with a hung jury. So 
they couldn't come to a verdict and in effect it let Beecher off the hook and after the trial though he wasn't found innocent he wasn't found guilty either and so after the trial he returned to preaching as if nothing had happened but it was like the O.J. Simpson trial in this sense as well. Everybody who had followed it, everyone in the world knew Beecher was guilty. And there's a great biography of Beecher that chronicles that case in detail. And in fact, if you want to study the, the case, I actually did a lecture on this two years ago, maybe, and it's on YouTube. So if you look up my name and Henry Ward Beecher, you'll find my YouTube lecture on Beecher and his, his trial. And one of the things that I mentioned in there is that uh, the records of that trial, exhaustive records, uh, have been preserved and are available uh, through Google, Google Books. But anyway, just 12 years after this sex scandal that Henry Board Beecher was involved in, that had produced six months of sleazy international headlines, Joseph Parker wanted to bring Henry Ward Beecher to London to share a platform with Spurgeon. And Spurgeon, at first delicately, but somewhat tersely, said, no thanks. In fact, here is the pertinent part of Spurgeon's reply. He wrote back to, Henry, uh, back to uh, Joseph Parker and said this, I feel I have no right whatever to question you about your course of procedure. You are a distinguished man with a line of your own, but your conduct puzzles me. I can only understand a consistent course of action, either for the faith or against it, and yours does not seem to exhibit that quality. I'm sorry that frankness requires me to say this, and having said it, I desire to say no more. He said, I think we had each better go his own way in brotherly friendliness, each hopeful of the other. To discuss your procedure would not be wise. In your letter just received, I greatly rejoice. And if this line of things is to be followed up, you will find me the heartiest of friends. But at this present, I had better say no more. Yours with the kindest wishes and great admiration of your genius. C.H. Spurgeon. So you can see he tries to be as complimentary and friendly as possible, but he tells him no. And he's very candid in saying, it seems to me you're being inconsistent with a desire to defend the faith, which is, of course, absolutely true. Parker replied to that with a statement that borrowed language from Matthew 5.23 and Matthew 18.15. He said, if thou hast aught against thy brother, go and tell him his fault between thee and thy brother. And he offered to come and meet with Spurgeon at his house. And so Spurgeon replied with a longer letter, quote, Dear Dr. Parker, if I had aught against you, I would see you gladly, but I have no personal offense nor shadow of it. Your course to me has been one of uniform kindness for which I am most grateful. The question here is very different. You ask me to cooperate with you in a conference for the vindication of the old evangelical faith. I do not see my way to do this. First, I do not believe in the conference. And second, I do not see how I could act with you in it because I do not think your past course of action entitles you to be considered a champion of the faith. There is nothing in this which amounts to having aught against you. You have no doubt weighed your actions and you are of age. These are not private but public matters and I do not intend to go into them either in my house or yours. The evangelical faith in which you and Mr. Beecher agree is not the faith I hold. Add the view of religion which takes you to the theater is so far off from mine, I cannot commune with you therein. I do not feel that these are matters in which I have the slightest right to call you to account. You wrote to me, and I tried to let the matter go by. You write to me again and compel me to be more explicit, altogether against my will. I do not now write for any eye but your own, and I must, and I most of all, desire that you will now let the matter drop. To go further will only make you angry, and it will not alter me. I do not think the cooperation sought would be a wise one, and I had rather decline it without further questioning. 
To make this public would serve no useful end. I have told you of the matter alone, and now I must decline any further correspondence. Yours with every good wish, C.H. Spurgeon. So again, he's very kind, but also very candid. Parker replied this time with just five words, best thanks and best regards. But Parker did not permanently drop the matter, nor did he respect Spurgeon's desire to keep it private. But two years later, on April 24th of 1890, just as Spurgeon's minister's conference was about to begin, Parker published an open letter in the British Weekly. And I can't read the whole thing, but here's enough to give you the flavor. By the way, in between all of this, Henry Ward Beecher died, so he never, never came and spoke for Parker at that conference. He had come the year before, so he'd been there with Parker, and Parker and he had struck up a friendship. But this conference that he was pleading for with Spurgeon never materialized. And notice by the dates, it's also at the heart of the the downgrade controversy. While Spurgeon is decrying the downgrade among Baptist churches, Joseph Parker is pleading with him to participate in a conference that would make him one of the purveyors of the downgrade. So Spurgeon had no choice but to say no. He said it as kindly but as candidly as possible, and he just wanted the matter to drop, but Parker wouldn't let it drop. Again, he published this as an open letter two years later, quote, when people ask me what I think of Spurgeon, I always ask, which Spurgeon, the head, of the, the head or the heart? The Spurgeon of the tabernacle or the Spurgeon of the orphanage? The kind of Calvinism which the one occasionally represents, I simply hate as I hate selfishness and blasphemy. It's that leering, slobbering, sly-winking Calvinism that says, Bless the Lord, we're all right, booked straight through to heaven first class, and insured against both collision and explosion. But as for those who've missed the train or been crushed to death, it's not for me to find fault with discriminating grace or to arrest the action of divine degree, decrees. Brother, pass the salt and shout hallelujah until you are black in the face. That kind of Calvinism I will not condescend to hate. It's too far down in its native perdition to allow of a boot to kick it and yet retain a boot's respectability. He said, I will speak frankly as to a brother beloved, and he's writing this directly to Spurgeon. It's, a, it's an open letter to Spurgeon, so he's talking to Spurgeon here. I'll speak frankly as to a brother beloved. Let me advise you to widen the circle of which you are the center. You're surrounded by offerers of incense. They flatter your weaknesses. They laugh at your jokes. They feed you with compliments. My dear Spurgeon, you are too big a man for this. Take in more fresh air. Open your windows, even when the wind is in the east. Scatter your ecclesiastical harem. He's saying to Spurgeon, you're not really infallible, occupying a sovereign place only in a pantheon of your own invention. And he ended the letter with a smarmy farewell and then wrote this. Am I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? In your inmost soul, you know that I am not your enemy, but your friend. The whole letter, you can find it in numerous places. And if you want to read the whole thing, I'll warn you, it's stunningly mean-spirited and purposely timed at the beginning of Spurgeon's conference to to create a frenzy of controversy on the opening day of Spurgeon's pastor's conference. And Spurgeon privately told the speakers at his conference, just ignore Parker. He ignored it himself, and that might have been the end of the matter, but even when Spurgeon died, Parker could not restrain the insults. He wrote a piece commemorating Spurgeon after Spurgeon's death, and he, he did have some nice things to say. In fact, Spurgeon's friend and biographer, W.Y. Fullerton, says, after Mr. Spurgeon's death, Parker paid a generous tribute to him in the Times, in which occur the following sentences. And then he quotes selectively some of the nice things Parker has to say. But Fullerton is being way too gracious with Joseph Parker, because even in his eulogy for Spurgeon, he couldn't resist pouring toxic sludge on Spurgeon's grave. In fact, here's the... Here's the part of the eulogy that Fullerton did not quote. Parker wrote, quote, 
Mr. Spurgeon was absolutely destitute of intellectual benevolence. If men saw as he did, they were orthodox. If they saw things in some other way, they were heterodox, pestilent, and unfit to lead the minds of students or inquirers. Mr. Spurgeon's was a superlative egotism, not the shilly-shallying, timid, half-disguised egotism that cuts off its own head, his was the full-grown, overpowering, sublime egotism that takes the chief seats as if he has a right for that. The only colors which M Mr. Spurgeon recognized were black and white. In all things, he was definite. With Mr. Spurgeon, you were either up or down, in or out, alive or dead. As for middle zones and graded lines and light compounding with shadow in a graceful exercise of give and take, he simply looked upon them as heterodox and as implacable enemies of the Metropolitan Tabernacle. Now that, you should know from everything we've talked about Spurgeon these couple of days, you know that's a bad character, caricature of how narrow Spurgeon was. He was a large-hearted man and very generous and very kind even with his adversaries. And Parker's description of him is exaggerated to the point of where I would say Parker was guilty of bearing false witness against Spurgeon even after his death. Spurgeon was indeed a man of constancy and simplicity. He was steadfast and immovable in the sense that Scripture compels us to be. He wasn't interested in theological novelties or massive paradigm shifts or in matters of doctrine. And you could tell from what Parker wrote that Parker loves the gray areas, the indistinct things. And it frustrated him that Spurgeon didn't share that love for things that are cloudy and uncertain. And, but Spurgeon loved consistency in, in worship and church polity and the, or the structure and content of a church service. And, he, and just that much steadfast immovability is all it takes to drive a man like Joseph Parker crazy. And I think that in his heart, Parker knew Spurgeon's refusal to be blown about by every wind of doctrine was really a virtue. And at the start of his article, he spoke of Spurgeon's simplicity, his constancy, his standstillness. And in that context, he managed to make those virtues sound positive. But he couldn't resist turning it into a backhanded criticism by portraying those qualities as raw egotism. I don't know if you counted the number of times he called Spurgeon an egotist. But Spurgeon was no egotist. Nor was he an arrogant or overconfident man. He never claimed that all truth was obvious to him in stark black and white clarity. He had a large heart, and in fact, his heart was clearly much larger than Joseph Parker's from the tone of those comments. Spurgeon never wrote that anything that nasty about anybody. But the point I want to make is that the linchpin of Spurgeon's entire philosophy of ministry was his conviction that no matter how much the culture around us changes, no matter how dramatically public opinion might change, the church herself is not entitled to follow the world. Her ministers must not think that following the world's fashions is a good strategy for reaching the lost. And we dare not share the world's values or obsessions. We don't need to follow the world's fads. Spurgeon hated pragmatism as an evangelistic strategy or a philosophy of ministry. He despised doctrinal compromise, no matter what reasons were given to try to excuse it or justify it. And when practically everyone else thought that modernism sounded like a step forward, like progressive, positive, full of potential and promise, Spurgeon resisted it. He saw wisely enough that it needed to be resisted, and he continued to oppose the modernist drift until the day he died, even though it cost him his reputation, his friends, and whatever influence he had, and whatever prestige he had earned by all those years of faithful ministry. In short, what mattered most to Charles Spurgeon was the truth far more than numbers or popularity or renown or academic acceptability or any of the things that so many of today's evangelicals seem to think these are the most important building blocks of a ministry philosophy. 
Spurgeon saw through that. And at the end of Spurgeon's life, the general consensus in the Baptist Union was that while Spurgeon had once been a great pastor, he was now merely a has-been. And younger men insisted that Spurgeon's views on ministry had become irrelevant because he refused to shift with the times. And if you took a poll among young Baptist pastors in England in 1990 or 1891, I'm, I'm, I'm convinced that the vast majority would have said Spurgeon was the doddering, diehard dinosaur and that Joseph Parker's ministry was the one you should imitate. Parker was pliable and open to progress and broad-minded enough to embrace even a man like Henry Ward Beecher. And he was just plain cool compared to stodgy old Spurgeon. And some people did say those things. And the Baptist Union basically had a referendum and they collectively decided that Spurgeon was irrelevant by voting to ignore all of the shrill warnings he had given them about the downgrade that doctrinal decline, decline that was destroying the Baptist Union from the inside. And I just want to point out to you that history has abundantly vindicated Spurgeon. There's a reason we still read and quote Spurgeon. Every Baptist worth his salt knows who Spurgeon is. They know that name. They know they have some idea of the preacher. But you have to explain even to the average pastor today who Joseph Parker was. He is not remembered the way Spurgeon is. And there's a reason that Joseph Parker's church, the city temple, is struggling and doctrinally adrift today. But meanwhile, the Metropolitan Tabernacle in London is full every Sunday. People at the Met Tab hear the same doctrines that Spurgeon was preaching in his generation. And it's the same message that John Gill was preaching to that congregation a century before Spurgeon. And it's the same message the first generation under Benjamin Keach and the founding members of that congregation. It's the gospel that kept them together in the 1600s. It's a church that has never been turned over to men who think the way ahead requires a complete overhaul of our ministry philosophy. And that's why they've stayed faithful. Some of Spurgeon's own students, young men who owed their training to him, told people they thought he's too old and sick and that's his problem. He's outlived his usefulness, they said. But it's a stubborn fact that Spurgeon's sermons are being read and distributed and benefited from by even more people today than they were when he was still alive. And those sermons were printed in the millions in his lifetime. By contrast, I don't know of anyone today who regularly reads or recommends Parker's People Bi People's Bible or considers it to be an indispensable tool. It's useful at times, maybe. But you aren't likely to find Parker's books in anyone's list of desert island books. And more to the point, Parker's philosophy of ministry was doomed to failure from the start. In a work titled The Company of the Preachers, David Larson says this about Joseph Parker, quote, he had a somewhat dismissive attitude towards theology and its importance, and sometimes he sounded mincing and mediating. His successor, R.J. Campbell, espoused the new theology and denatured the atonement entirely. Campbell was finally forced out in 1915 because of his socialist views. Campbell was subsequently then replaced with a rank liberal, and today the church is small and theologically weak and known more for their social work than the preaching of the gospel. Spurgeon was right to be concerned about the drift of Dr. Parker's lax attitude towards doctrine and his pragmatic approach to church ministry. And back to a sermon that I referred to earlier, sermon number 1427, Spurgeon's sermon called, What the Church Should Be. Remember that I said Spurgeon began that message by pointing out that the church is the house of God. It doesn't belong to us. We don't get to invent our own definitions of what the church should be or, or what it is. And in fact, these vision casting pastors today who claim their individual strategies are given to them in dreams and visions, they're going against scripture. 
Christ is the one who builds the church. And the church's task, while we are still here on earth, is simply to be a beacon of light that leads people to the truth of the gospel, which never does change. And in that sermon, Spurgeon defines the church with these words, quote, A true church is appointed of God for the conservation of the truth. And before the Lord, at the foot of the cross, in the power of the eternal spirit, we would pray that even unto death we may be faithful to that charge. And Spurgeon's sense of that duty was evident in everything he did, in everything he wrote, and everything he preached. As I said at the beginning, that sermon, What the Church Should Be, is based on 1 Timothy 3.15, where the church is called the house of God, the church of the living God, and the pillar and ground of the truth. Though Spurgeon's comments about the church often focused on the pastor and his character and his duty as a preacher and his accountability to Christ, Spurgeon was careful to say that the clergy are not the church. The church consists of the people who make up the flock. And in that same sermon, he said, the text speaks of the church of God, meaning all the people of God, not the clergy alone. The clergy are not the church. It would be a great pity if they were. In all churches, it is a great fault if the whole of the people are not involved in the work of the Lord, in the affairs of his house, and especially in the maintenance of the truth. He's saying this duty to maintain and defend the truth extends beyond the pastor to every member of the church. And that entire message, like the text of 1 Timothy 3.5 that he was preaching from, it all points to the importance of maintaining the truth. That was Spurgeon's passion. That was always at the heart of his concern whenever he spoke of the church uh, and whenever he talked about what we should be doing as Christians and in every controversy that he ever engaged in. That was his concern, the maintenance and defense of the truth. And I'll close with... One final quotation from that sermon. <clears throat> Spurgeon says, Our Lord never taught us to hide the gospel in little rooms down back alleys. He would have us come to the front as much as we can. The church is not a cellar to conceal the truth, but a pillar to display it. A city set on a hill cannot be hid. What is there to be ashamed of? We may ourselves remain unknown, but we must make the truth known at all costs. The church should be like a lighthouse, which is often built as tall as a tall pillar to bear the light at its summit. And like a memorial column, which bears a statue up on top of it, she should lift the truth of God up before the gaze of all men. Anyway, thank you for coming this week. Uh, let me close in prayer and we'll do the questions in the session later. All right. So let me close in prayer. Lord, we thank you for the time we've had together this week. And even though we've talked about historical matters and church matters, there's enough biblical truth in these issues that uh, we've been edified. And we pray that your spirit would drive these truths home in our hearts. May we share the same kind of conviction that we read about and hear about from Pastor Spurgeon. May we be that kind of person whose chief concern is the truth and the defense of the truth and the maintenance of the truth and the proclamation of the truth. May we all, each of us, take that duty to heart and bear it for the rest of our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.